beginning of the real temple of Ramesses III. We see the two pylons on both sides, the entrance right in the middle, and we see the traditional scene. Remember the slave pellet of King Narmer? Yes. He was holding one of the enemies, mm -hmm. killing him with... Well, this became the traditional scene to be on the facade of any temple. Over there, the king, Ramesses III, this time holding a bunch of enemies, like a bunch of banana from their hair. They are kneeling, their hands are up, asking for mercy, but no mercy. He is killing them, and he is sacrificing them before God, Amon Ra. And Amon Ra, the protector of the empire, is handing him the sword like he is helping him to defeat the enemies. On the other side, he is doing the same, but this time before God, Ra Harakti, the God of the sunrise, killing the enemies. We still have to know that there was no human sacrifice. This is just a traditional scene showing the king destroying the enemy for the god, before the god, by the help or with the help of the god. You want us to know how many men were killed in the war. So they cut their hands. They cut the hands of the dead enemies and brought it before the king and counting them. Oh my God. But sometimes they would cheat by cutting the two hands to double it. <laughs> so he ordered them to bring their penises. Mm -hmm. oh. Whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to know the right, the right number <laughs> of the dead. But actually oh, also by, by decapitating <laughs> the two features of a, a man's power, which is his hands, and his penis showing how humiliated they were by Ramesh II, how they were crushed by Ramesh II, and how they were controlled, Ramesh the Third, how they were controlled by Ramesh the Third. The writings on the wall. King either making offerings to different important gods or receiving blessings from different important gods. Now let's go outside around to another important scene. Okay, uh, the sea people came to Egypt and tried to invade Egypt. And actually, Ramesses III was so small, he waited for them by the area of the delta on the shore. They led them to go inside one of the branches of the Nile. And they were waiting on both sides, Ramesses III and his soldiers. And when they just went deeper and deeper, they start using the arrows. So here is Ramesses III on the shore. And this is the army of the, of the sea people going inside the delta to one of the branches of the Nile. And then they start shooting them and killing them by using bows and arrows. After that, they tried to go on the shore, see what is happening to them being destroyed. Again. After that, Ramesses the third is bringing them before that Amon Ra opened. Mm. The first type of this battle to take place in the history of mankind between people on the shore, people in the sea. The Egyptians were on the shore, the sea people were on the land. What was the official, what was the original language of ancient Egyptians? Well, the, we call it the ancient Egyptian language. Why? It's not the hieroglyph. It's not sure. Medunet. Medunet is the utterance of the gods. So the hieroglyph, which is later on known as the hieroglyph. The Medunet uh, was named hieroglyphic by the Greeks, which is the Greek word hero's glyphin, the sacred writing. Okay? So the hero's glyphin or Medunet, it was used only in temples or the correspondence of the king. But the people, they use what is known as the demotic handwriting. 
and later on heretic, which is more cursive way of writing. The word demotic means the people's writing. Now mm -hmm. I say now you say democracy, mm -hmm. the yes. people's rule. So democratic, the people's writing, mm -hmm. then heretic mm -hmm. after. So it spoke a complete different language. No, it's the in same ancient language, times. different handwriting. Yeah. The I'm same language, talk. different handwriting. Well, we don't know really, but we are imagining how it was talked. Like for example, if you want to say uh, God Ra is rising in the horizon, we say uh, Weben Ra M Achet, for example. Weben Ra M Achet. Ra rises in the horizon. Weben Ra M Achet. I count something like that. According to the phonetics of the Egyptian, which, uh, the ancient Egyptian language, which was uh, deciphered by. Uh, so it wasn't. Ar it wasn't Arabic. It wasn't Arabic. Arabic was uh, recently. No, no. When? No, no. It's not. When did? It's an, it's an old language, but was spoken somewhere else. So when, when did language? Arabic become a part of uh, Egypt? Egypt. Six hundred and forty-one A.D. officially. All right. Give uh, me the real word, man. Come on, yo. <laughs> Talk with go, go, go. Uh, Revolution What's going on? Mm. What's the name? What's the name, brother? What's the name? <coughs> Lindsay Freeman. Lindsay Freeman. Right. You have witnessed Ramsey the Third. Good money. Mortuary Temple. Mortuary Temple. Temple. It is incredible. Magnificent, man. This is a work that was done thousands of years ago. Like I said before, modern day man cannot duplicate this. Three. Words cannot explain this. You need to come in and see for yourself. And I'm just going to get out of this. History in the making. Let me say this. We're here to get our spirit back. Oh, Shay. <laughs> He's right. I'll yeah, show you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. terrorism should have started 500 years ago. Wow. Yeah, you can walk past me. Oh, Go past, bro. <laughs> How's it going? Uh-huh. My sisters, how you doing? Just fine, my little brother. How was the journey? Awesome. Awesome. Can't wait to come back. How do you feel about Ramsey the Third Mortuary Temple? I am in awe. That's all. So beautiful now. I can't, I mean, I can just imagine what it looked like thousands of years ago and how they did it. But it just shows the power, the intelligence that we as a people had and still have. We've got to go to the East. We've got to unite. We've got to embrace all the black brothers and help one another. That's beautiful. I'm with that. What's the name? My name? Yeah. My name is Hertha Jeanette Williams. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I am the grandmother of the bunch. One of our elders. All right. And, and you, miss? I'm the pain second elder. And you, miss? All right. Beautiful. These are the two giant temples, two giant statues of Colossus and Memnon. Hello. How you doing? This is not traditional African dress, this is Arab Egyptian dress. But every time you come over here to have a big gala be a party, it's not our thing, but they're going to have one on the ship. And if you want to hang out and party, you can get one. I suppose it's a lot of fun. And just nice t-shirts. These are always nice little gifts to have. And those are the cartouches or chenoux. French call them cartouche. And that name basically means bullet. The African name is chenoux. And the chenoux here and there was the nameplate. That was where the king had his names and titles. King of Upper and Lower Egypt, the Mighty One, the Mighty Bull, Lord of Ra. And that's what that symbolizes. You can take these t-shirts and have them put your name spelled in hieroglyphics there. The Africans didn't call these hieroglyphics. They called it the Medu Netcher. That means divine speech. A lot of these terms, hieroglyphics, hieratic, demotic, are Greek. They're not African. When you hear a person with a name like Tutmosis, Osiris, Isis, Ramses, those are Greek names. Anytime you have a name that ends with that I-S sound, it's Greek. And then the Romans come in and they introduce these Latin terms like Azania. For some people say it's the indigenous name for South Africa, that's ridiculous. Or names like Mauritania, those are Latin words. Those are not indigenous African terms either. At some point in time, 
we have to return to the source and begin to use African terminology for African reality. Until we do that, we will never fully understand our history, culture, and heritage. Okay? And Let's go to the museum. And what is the name for the cartouche again? Chinook. 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 As far as I know, that's the African name. So that's thing. what we're using. But we I know cartouche is French. We're not saying that What is this? God Amen. God Amen. This is during the time of Tutmos the Third, around 1480 BC. We talked about Tutmos the Third a little bit earlier. He is a nephew of Hapshetse. And that's a depiction of Tutmos the Third over there, the statue. He's on the throne for 54 years. And he is sometimes referred to as the Napoleon of Antiquity. It shows you what happens when you run the world. Now he lives 3,000 years before Napoleon. So if it was justice, Napoleon would be the Tutmos the Third of modern times. But anyway, painted black. Look how bright and vivid those colors still are. Like they just did it a few months ago. This is God Amen. And you see he has the fake beard. You can even see how the string is attached to the beard. You can see he has a crown. And what's on top of his head are ostrich feathers. The ostrich is very important because the ostrich is an African animal. So all of these things point to an African origin for the people of ancient Egypt. We are inside the Luxor Museum. show you a few more pieces and then you can walk around. I cannot. And no mistake. Now what he's holding in his hand are two arms, the key of life, and he's dead. How do we know that? Because the beard is curled up and he's in the mummy posture, the Osiris posture. You see the linen cloth and his arms are folded. Now, when I came to Egypt the first time with Dr. Ben about 1992, I really did not feel like I was in Africa. I felt like a stranger in a strange land. And it took me about a week to really begin to feel a connection. And how that happened was, we came to Luxor at the end of the trip. We went to Cairo and then Aswan and came up here. And by the time we got up here, I was feeling pretty cocky, like I owned the place. I knew my way around. And I left the group, which is something I encourage you to do. I guess I can tell you that because I'm supposed to be in charge. If you get a moment to yourself... Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. If you get a moment to yourself, leave the group. Go off in the corner of a temple or a museum by yourself. I came in here alone, and I sat in front of this statue, and I just began to cry like a baby. And this brother seemed to speak to me and say, Renoko, don't worry about it. But I got your back. You're at home. It's okay. And this brother represents the classical age of Egyptian literature. You can see how it was painted red. The paint is beginning to fade. The nose is somewhat broken, but that's a shown up brother. And that's a very important piece. Let me show you two or three more, because I know they're going to stop me any time. Mm -hmm. And then you can just wander around on your own. But there's about six pieces in here that are marvelous. And I can see since I've been here, they've taken out about eight or nine pieces. Some of the most African looking pieces. I think that there are so many African people coming over here mm -hmm. with consciousness that yes. they are beginning to gradually eliminate those pieces from the museum and put them downstairs. Maybe put them in the base in the basement. But you have the piece of Amen. You got Amen Hotep the third right there. All these are Akhenaten. 
right. the first monotheist, he inaugurated a revolution in art. You got Sinusrit the first, Sinusrit the third, and eight or nine other really, really good pieces. I say I want you lecturing. No, you can't lecture if you're not. <laughs> yep. The dynasty represents the third golden age. The old kingdom or the pyramid builders, the first golden age. The second golden age, the middle kingdom. It represents him and him. The third golden age is dynasty 18, 19, and 20. That's Tutmos III, Hephzibah, Akhenaten, King Tut, Ramses the Great. A lot of those pieces are in that room right there. And then the fourth golden age is Dynasty 25. Remember we were at the chapel today in Medinet Hapu and I said that this was a chapel of Amenirdis. That's the fourth golden age. That's Dynasty 25 and that represents the restoration period, the last great period in African history in ancient Kemet. Okay? So you all walk around and if you have any questions I'll try to answer them. But you can't lecture in here if you're not a tour guide. And I don't want to want us to go through a lot of changes. And they have a nice gift shop in there, books and some excellent postcards and pieces of papyrus. This is the god Amun of Karnak. This is a statue of King Amenhotep III. This is King Seso Stress III from 1873 to 1840 BC in Karnak. We're about to look at Men to Hotel as a scribe, 1971 to 1926 BC, Karnak. And this is his statue. This is a statue of King Amen the Third, 1841 to 1792 BC and this is the actual statue we have here Sphinx making an offering 1350 to 1336 BC South Karnak and here's the picture of the small Sphinx This is the head of a, of a royal statue wearing Nem's head, headdress, 1475 to 1465 BC. All right, King Tutmos III, 1490 to 1436 BC, Karnak. Alright, uh, King Amenhotep III with clenched fist, 1403 to 1365 BC, Luxor Temple, and here's the statue itself. Here we have Sobek and Amenhotep III. 1403 to 1365 BC, Dahamsha. 
the vizier Mepe Ka Shonti, 1850-1800 BC, Karnak, made out of limestone. And here it is. Here we have statues of Seti the First. Group statues represent God, Amun, Amun, and his wife, Goddess Mut. <coughs> On the throne of Seti the First, made out of granite, 1305 to 1290 BC, Karnak. And there it is. Here we have King Mentu Otep III as Old Cyrus, one of the earliest statues showing the king as the god of the dead with the tall crown, long beard, and full length cloak. 2010 to 1998 BC, Armand, made out of sandstone. ancient pottery work King Amenhotep the first made of sand made of sandstone 1529 to 1505 BC Karnak um, there you go. All right, King Amenhotep the Fourth, with double crown, made of sandstone, 1365 to 1360 BC, East Karnak. <laughs> Here we have a bed with lion's legs, lion's lion legs from the collection of King Tutankhamun, wood fiber, 1347 to 1336 BC, Kiruna. And as you can see, everything I'm showing you is from thousands of years ago, before Europeans learned how to read or write. So there's no way that they can claim that they created anything of what a foundation built, like sandals, we have a bed over there, ships, potteries, plates. All these were around thousands of years ago before Europeans knew how to read or write or eat, eat or even knew how to act like human beings which they still don't know how to do. So as you can see, everything I'm showing you is the foundation of what we have in this world today and it all came from ancient Africa. The Nile Valley Civilization is one of the major contributors 
the civilization of the world today. What's the thing they're doing? Are they too much? God, I, um, Here we have a statue of Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty, 1405 to 1367 BC. This statue is completely flawless. This is Amun and Mut, reign of Ramsey. The second, 19th dynasty, 1490 to 1224 BC. Ramses the second. Isis, reign of Tut, Moses the third, dynasty 18, 1490 to 1436 BC. Half of the statues been destroyed and a lot of statues have been destroyed for various reasons. From um, people digging them, up, digging them up out of the ground in the tombs, from earthquakes and who knows? Got a small sphinx right here. Goddess Horus, 25th dynasty. King Tutmosis III. Head also missing. But as you can see, most of what you see as far as statues, monuments, are clear of black ancient African design and the features are just obvious. Brothers and sisters, we're at the Luxor Museum in Luxor, Egypt and I've shown you almost everything as far as uh, ancient Egyptian art that's in the museum. All this work for my ancestors. And as like I said before, the writings are on the wall. You can tell by the features. And this is all creation of our people. Once again, I'm showing you the greatness of our people. Then you know that this resides inside of you. And we just have to come together and bring it out and rise once again. Black power. My brothers and sisters, I want to show you some pictures of these uh, devils, these Arabian devils. I know you didn't expect me to uh, forget about these devils and let them go. Can't let them go. Look at them robbing our ancestors' gravesite. 
this look at this robbing it and then everything that I've shown you in Egypt they are getting rich off from tourism But when anybody else outside of Egypt coming and taking anything, they call them grave robbers. But these Arabs are the original grave robbers. So that's how all these statues and monuments get from, from its original place into these museums and around the world. Look at that disturbing serving the peace of our ancestors. Who had a spiritual connection with the universe, life, and death. But you know, they will reap what they sow. I'm my brothers and sisters. We are live once again at Revolutionary Camp at Karnak Temple, Karnak Temple in Egypt. And we're looking at a roll of Sphinx, raw Sphinx. Okay, come closer, please. Come closer. That's our tour guide, Walid. Come closer. Walid. Who didn't get a ticket? Um, uh, this temple is considered to be the biggest religious worshipping temple or place in the history of mankind. Not just here in Egypt, not just in the world nowadays, it's in the history of mankind. The nowadays name of this place is El Karnak. El Karnak. But the ancient name was Epit Isut. Epit Isut. Epit Isut means the place of the thrones. And some scientists, they like to translate as the most selected place. It's the house of God Amon Ra. Actually, the word Isut, which we, which we can write it like this, I-S-W-T, W, in the ancient language, when it was added to one single, means many. So, Isit throne. Isut Thrones. And one funny thing is, the original name of Isis was Isit. Miraculously, it became Isis. I don't know why, but it's Isit. I-S-T. Anyway. Epit Isut, that's the original name of this place. How it became El Karnak. The Arabs, when they came 641 AD, they changed the name of the city. Not on purpose, they just thought they were palaces, so they called it El Oxor or Luxor nowadays, which means the palaces. But when they came to this place in specific, they found these two huge pilots, and that's why they called it Gwarna in Arabic means the great pilot. So Gwarna later on became Karnak or El Karnak, and that's the nowadays name or the known name about this place. In the new empire, which started around 1550 BC, the king of gods, the major god, the big god, the lord of all gods, his name was Amen Ra. Amen Ra. That's his place. That's his temple. On the east bank of the Nile here in Luxor, we have two temples. Remember yesterday we saw three temples on the west bank, but the temples on the west bank four for the dead kings, exactly. But temples on the east bank of the Nile here for gods. This one here, Al Karnak, is for God Amon Ra. The one we are going to see after that, which is Luxor, partly for God Amon Ra, but mostly for his wife, goddess Mut, means the mother. The ancient Egyptians <coughs> believed that major gods they come in family, a triad. The god, his consort or his wife, their son. Why is that? Maybe the big love of an ancient Egyptians to their family made them believe that the gods also, they have to have families. Mainly triate. 
And most probably this is one of the things that's opened the way for Christianity here in Egypt, the idea of the triad. <coughs> so the triad of Luxor, where got Amon Ra, his wife Mut, which means the mother, and their son also the god of the moon. The two temples, in the two temples annually there was a very important festival. The ancient Egyptians called it Opet festival. Nowadays we call it the Reunion festival. A very important festival. And actually, the king himself had to attend this festival. He has to be here. And this festival was simply like this. The statue of God Amon Ra was taken out of his shrine or sanctuary inside the temple. The statue of the gods were about that big. Pure solid gold. Pure solid gold. And the statue of the god was placed in the sacred bar, carried by the priests in a processional way, all the way up. That's why you have these ram-headed Sphinx Avenue. The ram was the pet of God Amun Ra, and the symbol of God Amun Ra, the symbol of fertility for God Amun Ra. And if you remember me talking in Saqqara, processional way means statues on both sides. That's why they had the ram-headed Sphinx Avenue, which were actually connected with the inside pylon. As I'm going to show you, they had to move the others away to open the open court for more structures. <clears throat> Taking the sacred bar on their shoulders with the statue of the god in it, coming out of the temple, step by step, not directly. Stations for stopping, making offering to the god, burning incense, resting the god. Then, if you remember that we have crossed a small wooden bridge over there, right? Because over there we had the canal. This canal was linking between this temple and the Nile. So the big boat was placed in this canal. The sacred bark was placed on the boat. Then they start sailing toward the other temple, or the temple of Luxor, for about two miles. Over there, or on the way actually, people on both sides hailing the god, celebrating the god, musicians, dancers, everybody around celebrating. And of course, the king also is there. Then when they go over there, they take the sacred bark of the god, they place it inside the temple, and his golden statue was placed with the golden statue of the goddess in the temple over there, staying together for 15 days. That's why we call it the Reunion Festival. We are inside the Karnak temples. found out this is the ideal place for adding any kind of buildings and as the kings wanted to serve their god by building something for them so that was the ideal place. See on both sides we have another ram edge things happening. They were part of the ones outside. The same as linking between the, uh, the, the, the canal and the inner final. So they had to move them aside so they can open the way for more buildings around here, as you see. Check out these columns inside the temple of Karnak. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, hello. Right here. The temple del uh, All right. This is the great hypostyle hall, the great colonnaded court of El Karnak Temple. Actually, this place was built by three kings because we have two types of columns here. The twelve in the middle, higher bigger in diameter, shaped like open back papaya. The other 122 on both sides, that means all of them 134. The other 122 on both sides, lower, smaller in diameter, closed back papaya. The 12 in the middle belongs to King Amenophis III, the father of Akhenaten. This side on the other side, started to be built by Siri the first, the father of Ramesses the second. But as he didn't rule for a long time, he didn't finish it. So his son, Ramesses the second, finished his father's part and completed this one right here. Remember the Ramesseum yesterday, I told you, we have a small colonial court and we have two levels. So Ramesses the second imitated this part in his own funerary temple on the west bank of the Nile. So when I say the 12 in the middle higher, and the other 122 are lower, and the whole place here, this part was sealed, had the ceiling, a roof. This part was roofed. That means two levels, right? That's how it looked like. See, the 122 columns like this, the 12 in the middle like that, it was roofed and two levels. And in the space between them, the junction area, there were windows. I will show you. We call them clear story windows to allow the slightest illumination to this part. You can still see some of the colors. And I want you to imagine that the whole place was roofed, slight color, slight illumination, and completely colored, fully colored. Can you imagine how beautiful? You know, it was beautiful, <laughs> real beautiful. How tall it is? No, I don't know actually the heights. Okay. I don't know the heights. But you can still see the colors. The colors yeah. See how big is the cartouches of Ramesses II? Mm -hmm. Yes. The side, impossible to erase. And if you insist on erasing it, you will destroy the whole thing. Yes. Shen. Shen. As a circle in the beginning. Shen. Shen. 